Welcome. In this video, we will begin discussing the WKB or a semi-classical approximation for case one, when the energy is greater than the potential. So what, we, what I mean by this is that we will begin considering that we have some particle and that the particle will be in a region where, of course, its energy is greater than whatever potential there might be. What is important is that the potential is relatively constant as we move in space, or it changes slowly. Keep in mind, that is the condition for the WKB approximation to hold. Now, what we want to do is begin by studying the Schrodinger equation, which we have seen often. And keep in mind what I mentioned in the previous video when we just quickly introduced the WKB approximation, is that we don't want to solve the Schrodinger equation. We know that it is hard, it is difficult. So for that reason, we will now look for a way to get our answer without having to solve the Schrodinger equation. So to do that, let's begin, as we have done many times before, by isolating the second derivative. So by doing that, we put this to the right, so we get e minus v, right, e minus v times the wave function, and then we multiply by minus 2m over h bar squared. And now notice what we have up here. We have 2m e minus v of x. So wh what that is, in case that it, is, it isn't immediately clear, that is the square of the potential if we are dealing with with a classical mechanics problem. So this 2m e minus the potential, this is the classical momentum. So momentum. Squared, of course. And that is, of course, why we call this the semi-classical approximation, because we do use some elements um, of classical mechanics. So we can rewrite this as minus p squared, which is a factor of x, just writing it out there so we don't forget, times psi. Okay, so our equation now turned into this. So this is what we now wish to solve. But we don't really want to do it by actually solving the Schrodinger equation, right? But instead, we will assume a solution. So we say, well, we know that we are in the region where the energy is greater than the potential. So for that reason, it wouldn't be unthinkable for our solutions, psi, to be of the form some amplitude, right? This is going to be amplitude, and it can depend on x. This is not a constant, right? This is what must be very clear. This is, uh, it could be cosine of x, or it could be some polynomial. I don't know. This is simply the amplitude. And then it is going to be multiplied by some phase. So this is very general. But we know that basically any function can be written like this. But it, it, it isn't really particularly specific, um, but it is certainly true. So let's now calculate the derivatives and plug it into the Schrodinger equation that we now rewrote. So what, actually, let me write it here explicitly. This is the phase. There we go. So one derivative means a prime of x. That's why it's important that you write of x, so you don't confuse this a with the normal constants that we usually have. And then e i phi of x plus, and now the derivative of the exponential, which will be i times the derivative of phi. Keep in mind that it depends on x. It isn't simply just your variable. And of course, let's not forget about our amplitude. Now, taking a second derivative, we get, let's begin here, a prime prime of x, e to the i phi of x, plus, then our a prime will still be there, and we derive the exponent. So we get i phi prime of x, and the exponent remains the same. And now we derive this other term here. So there we will get three terms. So one comes from deriving phi again. So we get i phi prime prime of x. 
e to the i phi of x and then a of x plus and now we derive the exponent so let me write the a in front i guess then we get um let's see i but we get another i since we are deriving the exponent so we get minus one so minus and then we get another phi prime so we get phi prime squared e to the i phi of x and finally we derive the a term so we get plus a prime of x i phi prime of x e to the i phi of x there we go so we can simplify this slightly since this last term is the same as this one so this is simply two times this oops so this one goes away and we get two times this okay now we want to plug this into the Schrodinger equation right here. So I'm a bit lazy, I'll just copy this. I don't want to have to write it down all over again. There we go. So copy it, paste it, and move it carefully. There we go. So this has to be equal to minus e squared of x h bar squared times psi, but psi is a of x, e to the i phi of x. Now notice that every single term has e to the i phi of x, and this can of course not be zero. So we can simply multiply by e to the minus i phi x, or divide by this term, however you want to see it, and we can easily get rid of it. And then we are left with basically two equations in one. Because if this is to hold, if we want this to be equal, then we need the real and the complex parts to be the same. Right? We need all the complex parts on one side of the equation to be the same as the ones on the other side and the same with the real parts. So for that reason, comparing the real part, we get, let's see, this is real, so we get a prime prime of x, and then here we have minus a of x phi prime of x squared, and then we have this part right there, which is minus pi squared of x over h bar squared, and then a of x. And now let's compare the complex part. So comparing the or the imaginary part. So there we need that 2 a prime of x phi prime of x plus phi prime prime of x times a of x. This has to be equal to 0 since there is no imaginary part on the right-hand side. So now we have two differential equations. Now, solving this one is easy. Right, this one we can solve very quickly. So notice what we have here. We have phi prime and its derivative. We have a and its derivative. So this is kind of looking like we could, you know, clamp it all together and just turn it into a total derivative. So here we are going to have to construct it a little bit. We have 2a prime, and here we have simply a. So if we had a squared of x times phi prime of x, right? Because what we expect when we construct this total derivative is that when we derive the first part, right? We get something here times what accompanies it, which is phi prime, and then we get the other thing, which has to be something like a, and we get this other thing. So this we are just testing the waters here. We're just seeing what's going on. So if we were to take this derivative, well, what do we get? Let's see. So if we were to take that derivative, d dx, this would be 2 ax times phi prime of x 
times the derivative, of course, of ax. So a prime of x. And then we get, we keep this the same, and then we have this other part, which we have to take the derivative of. So we get plus a squared of x times phi prime prime of x, which has to be equal to zero. And now notice that we have a here and a squared. And of course, the amplitude cannot be zero. Otherwise, we don't have a wave function, right? It cannot be zero. So for that reason, we can divide by a. So this here cancels out with the square and we get two phi of x by a prime, sorry, times a prime of x plus a of x phi prime prime of x, which is precisely what we had here. And is exactly the same. So for that reason, we can see that writing it like this is perfectly valid. It is the exact same thing. So we are now left with this equation d by dx of a squared of x phi prime of x and this has to be equal to zero which means that a squared of x times phi prime of x has to be some constant. Let's call it c. So if we want to find the amplitude for example then we can see quite quickly that the amplitude is c over psi, is not psi, phi prime of x, and we take the square root of all of this. Now, this is any constant, right? So the square root of any constant is going to be any constant, right? If we don't even know what it is, we can simply absorb it in. Or we can define this as c squared, so that when we take the derivative, it is simply c, right? But it's important that you know that it doesn't matter. It's simply a constant. And since we take the square root, we have to consider the possibility of a negative result. So there we go. A of x is this. Some constant, plus or minus, some constant divided by the square root of the derivative of the phase. So this is the result from equation number two. What about equation number one? Now this equation, as it stands, cannot be solved exactly. So we need to now use an approximation. So what we usually do is we say, okay, we assume that the second derivative is going to be much smaller than the other terms, right? The wave function will be varying very, very, very slowly. So that means that we can neglect this term. And when we do that, let's maybe go to the side. So we get um, let's see, minus a of x by prime of x squared is equal to minus t squared of x h bar squared a of x. Did we forget about anything else? I don't think we did. Okay, so this is now what we want to solve. Of course, since the amplitudes can't be zero, we can simply divide by the amplitudes. We also multiply by minus one. So we end up with phi prime of x squared is equal to p e squared of x over h bar prime. So we can take the square root and we get that this phi prime of x is plus or minus the square root of these things that are squared, so simply p of x over h bar. And this is the same, of course, than d phi of x dx. So this is a very simple differential equation. Phi of x is simply the integral, right? We integrate both sides, but we basically put an integral here and there. So we get that phi of x is the integral. Now, for now, we will leave it uh, unconstrained. Uh, but when we are dealing with a particular problem, we will then define its limits. And this is plus or minus, of course, e of x h bar. Now, if you're unsure why we are not adding a constant of integration, I will explain it in just a moment, um, because it will be much more apparent when we put everything together.
So notice that now we have a way of finding everything that we need. So we have a of x here, we have the phi here. And notice that here we also needed phi prime of x, but we also found phi prime of x right here. Right? We can see that phi prime of x, and actually we even wrote it down. I'm going to get rid of these here. Phi prime of x is plus or minus the momentum divided by h bar. So we have every ingredient that we need to plug it back into this general wave function that we built. So, psi of x, which we had written as a of x e to the i some phase of x, this is now, a is some constant divided by the square root of phi prime of x. Now, we can just absorb these plus or minuses into the constant, that's okay. But now let's rewrite our phi prime as the momentum divided by h bar. So this is the momentum divided by h bar. But h bar, since it is dividing the denominator, we can write as if it were multiplying the numerator. And of course, we need to include the square root. So let me now write this p a little bit larger, so p of x. But again, this here is, this c is any constant. So any constant times the square root of another constant, that is simply yet another constant. So that is why we don't really need to write uh, the h bar. There is no need for that. Okay, now comes the exponent. So times e to the i phi, which is right here. Maybe it's blocked by my camera, I'm gonna move. So there it is, which is plus or minus. So let's put it here, plus or minus. And then maybe let's divide by h bar here. Integral of p of x dx. Oh, we didn't write dx before, whoopsie. Okay, and notice that if we had included the constant of integration, so plus some c, it is the same as multiplying by e to the power of some constant. Actually, let's call it c2 because there's another one there. But the point is that this will now multiply our constant, and again, a constant, any constant times any constant is still any constant. So there is no change in defining a particular uh, limit for our integral. And that will be very useful. We will constantly um, take advantage of this fact that we can define the limits of the integral um, depending on our problem and it will end up being decided by this constant anyways. So there we go. This is our main result for this case. So this is for when the energy is smaller than the potential. Now we will in the next video do uh, an example and I think we'll do quite a few. But basically what we now have to do is we need to find P of X and that's it. So instead of solving the Schrodinger equation, now all we need to do is find P of X, which is given, don't forget, by 2M E minus V, right? E minus, let me make sure I'm not confused. E minus V, right? Um, Yes, e minus v. And that's it. We find p of x, we then integrate p of x dx in some interval that we will define depending on the problem, and we just plug it in. And that's it. The problem will be solved. So you can see how this will be very, very useful in the future. So, well, that is all for this video. Now in the next few videos, we'll do a few examples of this. I hope this was useful to you. If it was, please consider leaving a like on the video, commenting and subscribing, and maybe check out my Patreon. I will see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching.